in a room and all bow down. Yet on this particular day that's described in this peculiar text, Pharaoh did not feel worship worthy. Move the cursor of your spiritual imagination and envision in your own mind a prototypical Pharaoh. First, let's start with the fact that he is brown not white, he is brown, not white, Charlton Heston, notwithstanding, he is brown, he is bare-chested and rock-jawed, saggy in the pecs, but solid for a middle-aged monarch. He wore a cloth on his shoulders and a leather cone encircled by a rearing cobra on his head. His beard was false and his eye makeup was almond-shaped. He held a staff in one hand and rested his chin on the other. Slaves fan air and swatted flies around him. A bowl of figs and nuts sat within arm's reach on the table, but today he isn't hungry. He just frowns like 45 after an impeachment. His attendants speak in anxious, subdued tones because everybody knows when Pharaoh ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Dreams kept him up half the night tweeting in dream number one. Cows great, yes, yeah, somebody got it. Most of y'all didn't, amen. <laughs> Uh, in dream number one, cows grazed on the riverbank. Seven were fine and fat, prime candidates for a Chick-fil-A commercial. But while the healthy bovines weren't looking, seven skinny cows snuck up from behind and devoured them. Pharaoh sat up in bed, broke out in a cold sweat. After a few minutes, he dismissed the dream and fell back asleep. Yet dream number two was just as bothersome. A stalk of grain with seven healthy heads was consumed by a stalk of grain with seven withered heads. Two dreams with the same pattern. The seven bad devoured the seven good. Pharaoh woke up distracted and befuddled. He assembled a council and demanded an interpretation. Cows consuming cows, stalks gobbling stalks. Did the dreams mean anything? He asked his council, but they had no response not even a clue. Then his butler remembered Joseph from their days together in the penitentiary out on the yard. Can I stick a pen right there? Because God can cause people who forgot you to remember you and people who neglected you to need you. That's why you better be careful how you treat people because you don't ever know who you gonna need before your journey is over. You ought to practice on your neighbor right now. Look them in the eye like you got an attitude and they owe you $20. Say, you better treat me right, amen. See, the butler told Pharaoh about the Hebrew homeboy's skill at dream interpretation. The king snapped his finger and with a flourish of activity, it ensued. Joseph was cleaned up and called in. In a moment of high drama, Jacob's favored son was escorted in the Pharaoh's throne room. Can you see it? Look at the contrast. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, Joseph, an ex-shepherd, from the boondocks. Pharaoh, extremely and intensely urban. Joseph, uh, somewhat ruddy and rural. Pharaoh from the palace. Joseph from the prison. Pharaoh wore gold. Joseph wore shackles. Pharaoh had armies and pyramids. Joseph had a borrowed robe and a foreign accent. And yet the prisoner was unfazed. He heard the dreams and went straight to work. No need to consult tea leaves, horoscopes, or advisors. This was simple stuff like basic math for a Harvard math professor. Joseph said, God has shown you what he's about to do. Expect seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. Woom, it went over your head because nobody, including Pharaoh, knew how to respond. Can I explain? He said a bad word, a bad word, and Egypt, a F word in Egypt, famine. 
Famine was a foul word in the Egyptian dictionary. The nation of Egypt did not manufacture Chevys or export T-shirts. Their entire economy was built on farms. Crops made Egypt the jewel of the Nile. Agriculture made Pharaoh the most powerful man on the planet. A month-long drought would hurt their economy. A year-long famine would weaken the throne of Pharaoh. A seven-year famine famine would turn the Nile into a creek and their crops in the sticks. A, fam a famine to Pharaoh was the equivalent of electric cars to the sheiks in Saudi Arabia or a completed impeachment trial to the Republicans. It was an apocalypse. The silence in the throne was so in the throne room was so thick you could hear a spider walking on cotton or cough drop. But then Joseph offered a solution. He said, create a department of agriculture and commission a smart person to gather grain in the good years and then distribute it in the lean years. Officials who understood where he was gulped at Joseph's chutzpah because it was one thing to give bad news to Pharaoh. It was another thing to offer unsolicited advice. And yet this guy had not shown a hint of fear since he strolled up in the palace, and since he swaggered up to the king's throne. He obviously didn't know where he was. He paid no homage to the king. He didn't offer accolades to the magicians. He didn't polish apples, kiss rings, or for that matter, kiss anything else. Lesser men would have cowered, but Joseph didn't blink. Do you see the kind contrast I'm describing, the most powerful person in the room, Pharaoh, ruler of the Nile, deity of the heavens, grand exalted pupa of the pyramids, was in dire need of a double shot of Hennessy or Jack, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about, but the lowest person in the pecking order, Joseph, ex-slave, convict, accused sex offender, was cooler than a polar bear's toenails. What made the difference? Can I tell you quick what he had on the inside? It's what the dictionary calls ballast. Can I break that down like a fraction? Ballast is a counterweight, a counterbalance. It's what Bozo the Clown had at my eight-year-old birthday party that I described. Come here. See, I didn't know it at the time, but I later learned that that rubber clown was supported by lead weight, a three-pound weight hidden in his base that served as a counterbalance against all of our punches and Joseph as it turns out had a similar anchor not a piece of iron but a deep seated stabilizing belief in the sovereignty of almighty God you got to get that it's apparent in his first sentence it's in verse 16 Joseph said it's not me God will give Pharaoh the second time Joseph spoke he explained God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. That's verse 28. Joseph proceeded to interpret the dreams and then tell Pharaoh that the dreams were established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Four times in three verses, Joseph made reference not to himself or how he was going to do it better than everybody else, better than it's ever been done, how he was going to do it bigly but he made reference to Almighty God. And we've seen this before when Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce him. Joseph refused, not saying, I don't want you or I ain't into you like that. But he said, how could I sin against God? When fellow prisoners asked for an interpretation of their dreams, Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? He locked the magnet of his compass on the divine pole star. He lived with an awareness, my friends, that God was alive, God was active, and God was able to do something good. I dare you, about 16 of y'all, I make number 17, to lean over to your neighbor and say, neighbor, come on, talk to him, don't be scared. They ain't gonna hit you in church. Say, neighbor, God is alive, God is active, 
and God is up to something good. See, you have to hold that confidence. That's the secret to undeniable inner strength. It is confidence in the complete sovereignty of Almighty God. Pharaoh commanded a stunning turnaround. You got to read this when you get a chance. This is better than the final episodes of Power. This is better than Queen Sugar. This, this is better than Scandal. You got to read this. It's in Genesis 41:38. He turns to his officials and says, isn't this the man we need? Are we going to find anyone else who has God's spirit in him like this? Then he turned, wait, you got to miss, don't miss it. He turned the entire kingdom over to Joseph. That went over your head. I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. By the end of the day, the boy who came to Egypt in a caravan was rolling through Egypt in a royal chariot with 24s, second only to Pharaoh in authority. You talk about a comeback and the chaos called Joseph's life. I count at least one broken promise, at least two betrayals, several assaults of hatred, two abductions, more than one attempted seduction, 10 jealous brothers, and one major case of poor parenting. In the tragedy that is called Joseph's life experience, I see abuse, unjust imprisonment, 24 years of prison food, mix it all together, let it sit and settle for 13 years. And do you know what you get? One of the greatest bounce backs in the entire Bible. Jacob's forgotten son became the second most powerful man in the world's most powerful country. The path to the palace wasn't quick and it definitely wasn't painless, but somebody will agree with me tonight when I say that God took that mess and made something meaningful out of it. Have I got a witness? And don't you know it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for somebody else, he will do the same thing for you. God will take your mess, the mess of your life, the mess of your job, the mess of your career, the mess of your relationships, the mess of your children, and God will make something meaningful out of it. I know God will. You ought to tally up tonight the pain of your past. Add up the anger to the betrayals plus the tragedies plus the poor parenting, the wrongful accusations, the inappropriate touching, the molestation, the separation, the divorce, the mistreatment, the lies, the backstabbing. Life can be onerous, but I submit to you that God is yet in control. God can do for you what God did for Joseph. God can use the evil intended to destroy you as the energy employed to develop you. Wait, wait. So if your setback amuse them, make sure your comeback confuses them. See, I want to suggest tonight that someday, it might not be today, but someday, my friend, you will tally up the crud of your life and write this psalm over it. It's all good. Practice on your neighbor. Say, it's all good. Amen. Hey. Lieutenant Sam Brown did true story. Sam Brown was on his first tour of duty in Afghanistan when an improvised explosive device turned his Humvee into a Movtov cocktail. True story. He does not remember how he got out of the truck. He does remember rolling in the sand, slapping dirt on his burning face, running in circles, and finally dropping to his knees. He lifted up flaming arms to the air and cried the only prayer he could remember. After his days of being dragged to church by his grandmama, he shouted out, Jesus, save me. In Lieutenant Sam's case, the words were more than a desperate scream because he assumed that this was it, that death would come. His gunner did as well. With bullets flying around them, he helped Sam to reach cover and crouching behind a wall, Sam realized that 
bits of his clothing were fusing to his skin. He ordered the private to rip his gloves off. The soldier hesitated and then pulled, and with the gloves came pieces of his hands. As Brown screamed at what was the first of thousands of moments of pain, when vehicles from another platoon reached them, they loaded that wounded soldier onto the truck. And right before Sam passed out, he caught a glimpse of his singed face in the mirror, and he didn't recognize himself. That was September 2008. Over the next three years, he underwent multiple surgeries, and the pain chart didn't have a number high enough to register the agony he felt. And yet, in the midst of terror, beauty walked in. She was his dietitian. He remembers the first time he saw her, but more importantly, he remembers that the first time she saw him, she didn't flinch. After several weeks, he gathered the courage to ask her out, and they continued to see each other. She was not even a follower of Christ, but moved by his faith, she rediscovered faith in God. Fast forward, friends, the two of them got married, and now they have children, and Sam directs a program to aid wounded soldiers. You cannot minimize the horror he felt. You cannot imagine Imagine the torture of his surgeries and rehab. You cannot estimate the emotional toll it took on his life. Yet both he and his wife have come to believe that God's math works differently than ours. War plus wound plus rehab equals wife plus children plus family plus future plus hope. And with God's help, my friend, you can bounce back as well because that's the story of black people in this country. We know how to bounce back. We keep bouncing back. Poet laureate Langston Hughes wrote a poem many years ago called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I know you know it, but let me quote it tonight. For those who may have forgotten it, he said, I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood through human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and then built pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi where Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans. That I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the river. That's why we keep bouncing back because as black people, our souls run deep like a river. Okay, I guess you don't know how deep rivers run when you fly over the Mississippi and look down on it, remember you're only looking at the top of it. You don't know how deep it runs. And that's how the soul of a black person flows. That's why you can't prejudge a person based on the level of melanin in their skin because we got a soul factor to us. Our souls run deep like a river. Okay, you don't know how rivers run. When a river starts its course, it never changes. Once a river starts flowing, nothing can stop it. The river will flow over it, through it, or around it. Can nothing stop the flow of a river? And I've got news for you tonight. Can nothing stop a Negro once he gets in his flow? Slavery couldn't stop us. The middle path passage couldn't stop us, lynching couldn't stop us, Jim Crow couldn't stop us, segregation couldn't stop us, reconstruction couldn't stop us, redistricting couldn't stop us, discrimination couldn't stop us, gerrymandering couldn't stop us, the KKK couldn't stop us, and a bigoted, xenophobic billionaire in leadership, he ain't gonna stop us either. We keep bouncing back. 
Who knows tonight? Your rebound might happen tonight because on the morning of his promotion, Joseph had no reason to think that this day would be any different than any other day. Being prime minister before sunset wasn't on his agenda, but God exceeded his greatest expectation. And you do know that God has a way of exceeding your expectations. He began the day in prison, but in end of the day in the palace. God has a history of exceeding your expectations. Y'all are too quiet, so I'm going to call some witnesses. Ask Abraham wandering homelessly. Ask Noah before the rain started to fall. Ask Moses at the Red Sea. Ask Joshua marching around Jericho. Ask David facing Goliath. Ask the three Hebrew boys in the furnace. Ask Daniel in the lion's den. Ask Jesus on the cross and in the grave but you ain't got to go that far ask me I can tell you I thank God that God has always stood by my side God has always been my God when my friends walked away and turned back on me he stood right by my side God is good all the time and all the time God is good God is great and worthy to be praised. Just sit there. I'm going to shout by myself because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He restores my soul. He leads me in green pastures. He assigns goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. I keep bouncing back and I'm wondering tonight if I've got anybody here who's got a bounce back spirit. You ought to have five your neighbor and tell him I've been down long enough after tonight I'm bouncing back because they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they mount up like eagles they run and not be weary they will walk and not faint so whatever you got to do don't stay down bounce back see you next time Wow. What, what, what shall we say to these things? Huh? <laughs> my, 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 my. In other words, you have a counterweight on the inside of you. And you have the capacity, the potential to bounce back. Why? Because greater is he who is what? In you, Lord Jesus, than he who is in the world. Thank you. Dr. Watson, praise the Lord. Mm. Quite honestly, I don't, ever, I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone uh, expound upon the life of Joseph quite like that. I tell you, we were blessed tonight. And there's so much, so compact. Uh, the word was delivered and even now you have it within you and you've always had it within you and I believe sometimes when trials and tribulation come it will bring that word out of you and that's what we want you know we talked about a few nights ago sharing what you have with others sharing the word of God sharing the presence of the Lord Jesus who has enabled you to bounce back enabled our people generation after generation to bounce back you have that on the inside of you if you believe in the Lord Jesus you've got it you've got it you've got it well my brothers and sisters uh, I want to encourage you uh, if you if there's anyone here who does not know the Lord Jesus. You've never given your life to him. I urge you, I plead with you, I beseech you on this night to give your life to the Lord, to ask the Lord to come into your heart. Believe now that he took your place on that cross and that he died 
for your sins and he died for my sins and then he was raised from the dead by the power of God to prove that he was who he said he was. And Jesus said, if I have overcome the world, you will overcome as well. I, I, I beseech you, I plead with you, I plead to give your life to Christ tonight. Come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Look, take the blinders off so that you might see in Christ, you will be able to see in Christ. If you're lame, you'll be able to walk. If in Christ, if you're wounded, he will heal you. He will heal you. I'm here to tell you. I'm here to declare. There are too many of us in here who God has been good to. I'm here to tell you that he will heal you tonight. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's stand on behalf of those or behalf of someone who wants to give their life to Christ. Let's stand, and we're going to sing the, the invitation. We're inviting you to come right now. We're inviting you to come right now. Give your life to the Lord. Listen, you don't have to join this church, but first and foremost, give your life to Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, we got a lot of folk who will walk with you. Let's, let's sing this all together. I surrender all to Jesus. Will you give your life to him? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We invite you to come. Brothers and sisters, it's been so good to worship with you uh, these past three nights. Uh, we have been truly blessed by the word. I think we have what we need perhaps to go on uh, throughout the year. I mean, you can feast on this throughout the year, all right? Amen, amen. You know, I want to take the time right now uh, to thank uh, the associate pastor because, you know, we've had uh, so many wonderful uh, men of God to come through here and the person who gets in contact with them and who makes out the order of service is the associate pastor named Dr. Roosevelt Mars. Let's give him a hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 My brothers and sisters, you go out and tell somebody about the good news of Jesus. Tell them about, you know, what God has done for you. And never underestimate the bounce back power that is on the inside of you. Praise the Lord. Listen, I want to remind you that on uh, tomorrow night, Thursday, 630, uh, we're going to have a young adult ministry Bible study uh, in the chapel for all of you young adults. I want to encourage you uh, to be a part of that. Uh, and, and really, you know, all are invited, but, you know, we're focusing on young adults. I am no longer a young adult. I might look like a young adult. Praise the Lord, I thank you. But I'm, I've been around for a while now. I've been around for a while. Praise the Lord. But all of you 18 to 25, we'll go even to 35 years old, we want you to come out uh, to our Bible study uh, on uh, tomorrow night. Well, uh, my brothers and sisters, let's give uh, Dr. Lance Watson a hand once again. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, I, 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 wish, I wish I could tell you there's so much more uh, to this powerful man of God, this, this committed man of God, than preaching. And I tried to give you a little bit, you know, when I introduced him, when I presented him to you about some of the wonderful things he's doing up there in Richmond, Virginia, small groups. I mean, expanding the church, uh, taking on projects. What was that called? The City of... 
the city of possibility, that neighborhoods, parks, schools, activity centers, bringing our people together, loving on our people, reminding us all that we're connected in this country. We are connected not only, not only by blood, but through the shed blood and the spirit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And with him, all things are possible. Amen. Well, let's stand and receive the benediction for uh, this evening. And now, my brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let the church say amen. Amen. Shake one's hands with someone next to you. Tell them God loves you, and so do I.